The environmental industry, a partnership of science and engineering, business and government, working on society's most challenging technical problems. To educate the public about this important industry, the Air and Waste Management Association presents the Environmental Management Team, a video series about people and technology and the search for environmental solutions. In this first program, we look at how new ideas and technologies are changing the way cities and towns manage one of their costliest problems, solid waste. In the early 80s, the method of waste handling was simply to landfill waste. And there was not much concern at that time about the designs of the landfills. Many of them were unlined. Uh, very few had leachate collection systems. And they were, in effect, old uh, holes in the ground into which waste was, was put. By the um, mid-80s, then, the state of Minnesota was directed by the state legislature to stop landfilling waste as our major method of waste disposal. The problem we had is that in mid-87, our local landfill closed, and our costs just literally skyrocketed. They went from $25 a ton for disposal, our tipping fee, to over $100 a ton. So there was literally overnight a four-fold increase in our disposal cost. Pushed by landfill closures, the high-density city of Newark, New Jersey, and the 47 cities and towns that make up Hennepin County, Minnesota, were among the first U.S. communities to adopt large-scale integrated solid waste management. The integrated approach is based on a hierarchy of solutions, beginning with efforts to reduce volume and toxicity. This is followed by programs to reuse, recycle, and compost. Most of the remaining material is converted to energy, and only a very small amount of residue ends up at the landfill. How solid waste is managed varies around the world, even from city to city within the same country. But the concept of integrated waste management can be applied anywhere, helping communities to reduce waste and pollution, move away from old bury-it-all or burn-it-all solutions, and save money. There is no single answer, however. The integrated approach offers a range of options, and each community must assemble a system to meet its own specific needs. You take samples of the waste and look at what's really there. How much are they really generating? And of that, what are the commodities that are in that waste stream? Then you can begin to look at what are the existing facilities a community has? What are the markets for these materials, the commodities really, which are in the waste stream? And start to figure out what would be the best mix of approaches for the community to address the waste stream in the pieces that they have. And one of the things you evaluate when you're doing that is how much is all this going to cost, how elaborate a system can you do, how much the community is willing to step up and do, and what kinds of facilities you need to get this accomplished. We estimate that uh, we could probably save an additional $3 million a year through further educating the public on the importance of reducing the amount they're throwing away. And the way we save is that for every ton less that the consumers throw out, that's one ton less that we have to collect, it's one ton less that has to be processed, and it's one less ton that has to be disposed of. The amount of municipal solid waste generated around the world is growing rapidly. In the U.S., it went from 88 million tons a year in 1960 to 180 million tons in 1988, and is projected to reach 216 million tons of waste in the year 2000. Fueled in large part by a worldwide explosion of population, excess packaging and throwaway products, this increase has more than economic costs. Environmental costs are skyrocketing, from waste disposal itself, natural resource depletion, and pollutants released by unnecessary raw material extraction, manufacturing, and transportation. Lowering these costs depends to a great extent on our ability to reduce waste. In industrialized countries, this means changing wasteful habits, 
In developing countries, it often means not acquiring those habits in the first place. In either case, waste prevention is an area where individuals have a big impact, but it's the least well-developed waste management component. To change this, municipalities have a variety of strategies to choose from. Public environmental education is a good first step. Other strategies include charging by the can or bag for trash collection, providing incentives to product repair, rental and resale businesses, and encouraging industry to both increase product durability and minimize disposable products, packaging, and its use of toxic compounds. Governments are also discovering that they can have a direct impact on reducing waste through their own purchasing and product maintenance decisions. What we need to do to improve the analysis of what we are purchasing and what happens to it is review in each major purchasing decision the content of the materials being purchased, including whether there is any toxic content that then will require special handling at the point of disposal. We need to review whether or not the product includes recycled content. Um, if it's a fabric, if it's roofing, if it's siding, it should contain a percentage of recycled material in that product when we are buying that new product. Additionally, we should be looking at the life cycle cost and handling method of that product, whatever it is. The waste prevention strategies of private companies, small and large, also play a critical role in reducing the municipal waste stream. One company taking a hard look at its environmental cost is 3M. Their Pollution Prevention Pays Program, or 3P, has served as a model for the private and public sector and has found new profits in waste prevention. No question that it's more expensive to handle the waste once you've produced it. Uh, the object of most 3P programs is not to produce the waste in the first place, and uh, that has other ramifications, too. Uh, generally, it improves the quality of your product, uh, the yield in your process goes up, the reducing your uh, manufacturing costs. There are, there are a lot of side benefits to, uh, to preventing waste. Whatever you seem to do to improve your um, approach to the environmental issue, also seems to help uh, the economics of your manufacturing process. So that's what I mean when I say things, economics and, uh, and the environment are, are really merging in this day and age. The cost of our citywide recycling program um, is roughly one and a half million dollars a year, taking into account our avoided disposal cost. We're breaking even in our curbside efforts. Uh, but because of our other recycling activities, like our composting operation, like the fact that we're recycling our concrete and asphalt and a lot of our demolition material, our actual avoided disposal costs are more in the area of $6 million. So in a way, you can almost say that we're making money uh, through our recycling efforts. Successful large-scale recycling programs like Newark's and Hennepin counties are dependent on many interrelated components. First, there must be a commitment by municipal leaders to make it work. Then the organizations that collect, process, and market the materials, whether public or private, have to work efficiently. And probably most important of all, the public has to cooperate, which calls for effective, ongoing education and simple, reliable, accessible collection systems. Since the early 1980s, the number of materials collected in municipal recycling programs has steadily grown to include as many as 30 items. A trend-setting program in Hennepin County collects problem and hazardous waste for either recycling or safe disposal, keeping pollutants away from waste to energy plants and municipal landfills. The county has two permanent facilities which really combine reuse, recycling, and special handling of consumer wastes. One of them contains a, a goodwill collection site inside so that a person could come in and bring materials for reuse that they'd um, identified in their home as well as their problem materials and household hazardous waste. And these items are taken at no charge and the county program does pay for whatever handling is necessary. 
In addition to municipal drop-off centers, recyclable items can be taken out of the waste stream in a number of other ways. There are privately operated buyback centers that pay people for their recyclable items and are particularly important at bringing scavengers and the poor into the formal economy. There are processing facilities, like this one in San Marcos, California, that separate recyclables directly from mixed solid waste. Then there is the most common option, curbside collection. After collection, recyclables that are already separated can be processed directly into new products. In the case of mixed or co-mingled materials, however, they first go to a materials recycling facility, or MRF, where they are separated and processed for sale. These facilities are designed to reliably provide hundreds, even thousands, of tons of high-quality raw materials to manufacturers every day making them a critical component in many municipal recycling programs. We look at ourselves as being in the commodity business, the industrial commodity business. And that means we're not competing with other recyclers necessarily, although of course we are. We're really competing with raw materials. Our glass competes with sand, soda, and limestone. And that combination for a ton of glass may be in the range of 60 to $70 a ton. That's what we're competing with. We have reduced the residue to about one and a half percent of what comes in. And in uh, New York City, we will guarantee a three percent residue level. But that's because we have developed processes and procedures and recirculation systems to continually remove as much material as is humanly possible that has a market value. But as the systems for collection and processing have steadily matured, Markets for recycled materials have lagged behind. We still need the markets to reuse those materials. And they're starting to happen, particularly in some areas like the newspaper, for example, uh, slower in other areas. Right now, I feel like we're trying to take all these materials out of the waste stream and stuff them through a keyhole. And I'm just waiting for somebody to open that door. Composting can handle up to 75% of the waste stream in the United States. There are some supermarkets and food factories we've dealt with that after we put in a good recycling program for their, for their metal and their glass and then take their compostables, they're generating maybe 2 3% waste. That's all made possible by composting. Composting is not a panacea. It won't take care of everything. But as any, any one single category in recycling, it definitely has the lion's share. Composting is simply the natural decomposition of organic material. It can be done on a small scale in a backyard or farm, or on a large scale, where it is already common for managing yard wastes. But it is not limited to leaves and grass clippings. Any organic component of the waste stream will decompose, and so composting is becoming an increasingly important part of integrated solid waste management. In New Jersey, American Soil Incorporated took the same simple, inexpensive equipment and techniques used in their yard waste composting operation and began an innovative program to compost clean, source-separated food and paper materials from the food industry. The highly fertile end product is then sold to a wide range of customers, from commercial farmers to backyard gardeners. The only increased difficulty with uh, when you bring in food and paper materials is you have to pay a little more attention to managing it. Uh, just as if you brought in a lot of grass clippings and let them sit, you'd have a tremendous odor problem if you didn't keep them aerated. And when you bring in that food and paper, you've got to grind it up, make sure that it's aerated, make sure that it heats up well so you don't have any seagull problems and that sort of thing. What I'm hoping is 10 years from now, people will not think it'd be that unusual at all and just say, oh, food and paper materials, we compost them naturally. A number of municipalities also compost mixed solid waste, either by itself or in co-composting operations with sewage sludge. These operations permit composting of a larger portion of the waste stream, but require more complex and expensive technology. Many also have difficulty separating out pollutants, yielding compost with restricted uses.